Welcome to this audio session recording taken at the Agroforestry Show, which was organised in September 2023 as a partnership between the Woodland Trust and the Soil Association. For more session recordings, go to agroforestryshow.com or explore and subscribe to the Agroforestry Show YouTube channel. Enjoy! Hi, uh, it's great to see so many of you here. Um, so. Brian was going to speak a lot about eucalyptus. I'm, I'm going to be slightly more broader in what I talk about. Uh, um, it's really great to see so many of you here because uh, a couple of weeks ago the, the biomass strategy came out and for anyone who's in the biomass crop sector like myself it was uh, a, a, a very, very big disappointment I have to say. There is uh, very little in there that is going to help anyone soon plant a crop and uh, make it slightly more um, uh, lucrative for themselves. Now, having said that, that doesn't mean that you can't continue to do the right thing and uh, plant these uh, crops anyway. You don't always need a grant or a subsidy or an incentive to plant something for the environmental purpose. And uh, the good, the, gr the great news is, is that there's loads and loads of uh, research that's gone into it. There's a bunch of companies that have a uh, tremendous amount of knowledge, like myself, who've been in it for the uh, best part of their entire life, that have uh, really stuck with it through, through thick and thin. We're environmentalists, I have to say, all of us, because most of the people who wanted to make a quick buck have uh, got out of the system very, very quickly. So we are on your side and we want you to be on our side. Um, I deal with willow, miscanthus, eucalyptus, poplar, um, but also a bunch of any, any crops that you can think of as an environmental purpose. And the leaflet on your, uh, on your uh, chairs there is an app that I'm developing with Chris uh, from AFB um, and um, uh, NFU Energy and uh, the digital provider Calvium, which will help people like yourselves make decisions on whether it's a good idea economically, logistically, and uh, to, uh, how you make those first baby steps to putting a cutting or a rhizome in the ground. Also, the, the great thing about EnviroCrops is that uh, it will be a virtual marketplace. Uh, so once you have that crop, um, and, um, a bit like uh, some of the, some of the uh, crops here, you will be able to find a market because you will be able to use the virtual marketplace that we're developing. So think of the first part of it as compare the market, the second part as eBay, so you can put your, your wares on there. People like myself, one-man bands, uh, consultants, contractors, agronomists, they can put their wares on there. So you can find the right person to help you do a brilliant job and all the while helping the environment. Now, the next part of it is that uh, there will be an element of quality in it. Uh, we're trying to embrace the, the sort of uh, another digital revolution in things like checker trade. So you know that uh, the, the people that you're getting through the system are quality activists uh, producing quality products and all that sort of thing. Um, the other great thing is that there will be best practice guidelines for every crop and so all of the information every step of the way will be available to you. So think Wikipedia, EnviroCrops combining comparethemarket.com, um, eBay, Checker Trade, and Wikipedia. How good is that? Now, the, the best thing about it, I think, from your perspective, is there will be no shareholders here. We will be a not-for-profit thing that is um, all fed in. All of the science uh, will come from institutes, peer-reviewed journals, um, and then it, anything that we make out of the transactions that we have in the, market, in the virtual marketplace will go back into de developing the app, adding further crops onto it, and also helping us uh, support um, trials of biomass crops so people for the next several decades can uh, plant the right thing in the right place. So that's EnviroCrops, which is hopefully a very exciting thing. Now, with the leaflet on your, on your chair there, we are running a competition because what we need is to make sure that uh, at the end of the three years of funding, when we go commercial, that this works brilliantly for every one of you, be you a farmer, be you a consultant, be you an end user who wants things. So if, if you look at the, um, the EnviroCrops um, app as it stands at the moment in its uh, fairly embryonic form, if you could play with the app and play the game, which is called Cropper, and the 
um, and, and then provide some feedback on that. There's a chance that you'll go into a draw to win a £50 Amazon voucher. Now, there's 10 prizes to be gained. Uh, and I know what you're going to say, why does it have to be Amazon? Unfortunately, it's because uh, the, ma the majority of people that we envisage filling out that form will be college students, agricultural students, and uh, a £50 voucher at a farm shop probably wouldn't be as an, much of an inducement. We want to get the next wave of, um, of uh, decision makers, be they farmers or pol policy makers, uh, filling out that so, so they know, uh, we, we know exactly what they want from a digital tool. Um, so, I'm just going to go back to the, the policy side of things. Now, that doesn't mean that us as an industry, and as, as I said, we're all environmentalists because we're in it for the right reasons. Um, we have put together a, a, a policy statement that we have shared with, um, with government, with academic institutions, and with, um, with environmental NGOs because we feel that um, we're being failed, Willow, Miscanthus, Eucalyptus, and Poplar are being failed at the moment, and as a result, environmental protection measures are being failed by um, poor uh, a policy vacuum. So what we've decided is the only way to do this is to all sit down together at, the, at a table and try and thrash out what is the best way of going about this. And uh, we feel that there is a way to get the environmental gold standard whilst using productive species, and then you can tier it down to just production when people just want to produce a lot of material very, very quickly. So thinking of big blocks of uh, willow or miscanthus. But the gold standard, of course, would include your pollinator services and your biodiversity net gain and all of those sort of things. Um, perhaps even uh, native um, uh, male willows on the uh, outside of your willow plantation in order to maximize the amount of pollen that a plantation is producing. So all of these sort of things are possible. Uh, and the industry as it stands, based, made up of, of experts who have uh, done the hard jobs, we can work with government and NGOs and uh, academics to create those. Now, at the moment, if you wanted to, to go ahead with the, the gold standard, we're looking for people that uh, would be prepared to put their land in that direction, then that would be brilliant. We would love to do that. Very few people have even... Uh, entertain that idea because everyone's waiting for a grant or an incentive that has not materialized and I'm afraid to say if you're still waiting for that um, it won't happen anytime soon because we've got an election next year we've got uh, the, the possibilities of an outgoing government and incoming government who knows and um, we, we've probably got a spending review next year um, there's nothing on nothing in the biomass strategy to give any inkling that there will be funding for this soon so it is a case of if you are there and you want to, if, if, if you've got um, a problem or you've got something that you feel, actually, I could make a difference environmentally, you can do it because these crops will work and uh, the industry can help you. Now, some of the, the things i am just uh, um, talk about. So, for instance, um, flood mitigation. Now, at the moment, there are grants for um, native trees planted at wide spacings um, over long rotations to help with flood mitigation. And that's, that's fine, and that they will work in a few decades' time. If you want to make a difference now, if you want to stop things floating down streams, blocking bridges and culverts, if you want um, to uh, save that car from uh, I don't know, floating down and, uh, and knocking into to, um, an animal or something like that, it can be done with willow miscanthus. These are perennial crops that stay in the ground. You don't have to harvest them every year. They can do a massive environmental good. The other thing, apart from stopping um, and stemming the flow of floating objects, they can also uh, stem the flow of water, giving people downstream maybe up to two hours more advance warning in order to get their property, themselves, their pets, out of harm's way. What a brilliant thing. So, you can plant a crop that is productive for a biomass point of view, and uh, you can uh, do, do an environmental good in that way. So, for instance, local authorities could benefit, uh, insurance companies could benefit. It's, um, it's, it's one of those things that is, for me, a no-brainer, because with willow miscanthus, you've got hydraulic roughness. You've got lots and lots of stems very, very quickly, whereas a single-stem tree planted at wide spacings, it's going to take years if not decades to to reach that same sort of level so that's uh, that's one 
aspect. Um, another thing, of course, lots of people will be livestock um, producers here. And of course, with livestock comes lots of uh, slurry. And slurry has a, a, a knack of finding its way into water courses. Willow and miscanthus and, uh, and other fast-growing species are brilliant at buffer strips, riparian buffer strips, at uh, uh, um, taking up point source pollution risks, all these sort of things. Um, I'm going down to um, a campsite next uh, week which has these uh, amazing pods, and each of the ecopod has a small amount of willow that uh, all of the effluent from that ecopod is just going into the willow. Very, very easy system. Uh, the, the government last week um, uh, look, are looking to ease restriction on zero discharge um, of effluent from new, new housing. However, if you still want to go to the environmental gold standard, and one of my customers is going to do that, you can still do it with a willow solution. So from his five-bedroom bed, house, he will build a... Uh, zero discharge system and then as a belt and braces approach he's going to put another willow plantation in so anything that does come through the zero discharge has another place to go it's um it, for him it works and uh, so anyone who has that sort of idea and isn't necessarily wedded to getting a grant for it you can do it and it will work now the science is there um Biodiversity, so I've mentioned pollination services. Um, willow, in particular, is one of those uh, genera that has been around since the dinosaurs uh, vacated our, the Earth. They, they've been around for 60 million years in one form or another. Now, that means that they're a very old genus that spreads across the world. Anywhere in the temperate um, world, there will be willow species. Those, the insects have evolved at the same pace as the willows. So insects do not recognize a non-native willow. That is a fact. Uh, so s some people want just to plant natives, but I can guarantee you that the, the, the insects don't mind. And if we want to improve pollination services and we want to increase pollinator numbers, then what better than a tree crop that produces uh, nectar and pollen sources at an early stage of the year, in January to, to March, when there's very little else around in the countryside. So an absolute big, big win there that unfortunately hasn't uh, found its way into, um, into policy or schemes yet. Um, so in, in terms of bird life as well, there, there's plenty of ways of... Um, of uh, of, there's plenty of species that are, are improved in farm situations compared to the common status quo. Um, you will see so much more bird life in your willow plantation. And the more that you have blocks with buffers in between, you will get edge effect. And what birds do, they don't necessarily um, nest in the willow. They will still stay in the hedges, but they fly into the willow, get the bugs, come back to the hedge. And uh, if you are quiet for any degree of time next to a willow plantation, you will see this again and again. So maximizing edge effect, um, you can produce a productive crop of willow and also be very, very environmentally friendly. So a call to action in a way. So if you have those environmental uh, uh, desires, then you can do it. You just uh, won't get the, the grant to do it. The great thing is that um, even though the government have, haven't been wonderful in terms of the policy, they've been fantastic in terms of providing um, inputs to innovation. Um, the EnviroCrops one is uh, DESNES funded. There's other projects that are uh, DESNES funded as well, and also some that are DEFRA funded. So on the DESNES um, funded projects, there is Biomass Connect. I would love to see some of you at uh, events that we're holding over the next uh, few weeks. Uh, if you go to biomassconnect.org, you will be able to see all of the What's On guide to anything, any event that is uh, dealing with uh, biomass. But specifically, there's eight sites across the country that have willow, miscanthus, eucalyptus, poplar, rubinia, cedar. Um, in Northern Ireland, they've got hemp. Uh, they've got other energy grasses. They've got other SRF. So if you want to know what grows well in your backyard, then go to Devon next week or um, 
uh, Wales the week after or AFPI at the end of the month uh, in Northern Ireland, you will be able to see what grows well. What a great resource. Um, so that's Biomass Connect. Uh, the, the, the website is fantastic also, and there will be a series of webinars this, uh, this autumn. Um, I chair the webinars, uh, and uh, we have people like Chris, um, experts, uh, uh, speaking about things like uh, water treatment and, and the like. Um, th there's also these other innovation projects that Desnes are funding, which will transform the industry. So um, a particular one called Net Zero Willow is producing new machinery for um, willow production. That will increase yields by around 20 to 30 percent. So you could potentially reduce your open or, or increase open space by planting those or engineering those buffer strips into your willow and still be so much better off. And the reason why is because it's uh, precision planted with robots and then harvested also with, um, with uh, much more uh, environmentally benign uh, machinery than is currently available. So that's going to make a massive difference both um, from a life cycle analysis but also from um, uh, in, in terms of um, just uh, the, the, the yield potential and everything. Um, the one final project I'm going to mention is called the, um, uh, the Center for High Carbon Capture Cropping, CHC times three. Now, that will, is, is kind of the missing link between Biomass Connect and EnviroCrops. So all of the information that is developed on carbon cropping, <coughs> flax and hemp and, and cover crops and forages, is going to be put into EnviroCrops. So in, by 25, 26, all of these other crops will be coming in from information from that, uh, from, from that uh, project, which is absolutely fantastic. What, what was it called again? Center. It's the Center for High Carbon Capture Cropping, and that's uh, run by NIAB, uh, CHC times three. Uh, Biomass Connect is run by the Center of Ecology and Hydrology uh, UK, uh, and EnviroCrops is run by Athby, who's uh, uh, Chris there. So um, I think I've probably covered everything I want to cover. Um, I'm not sure if there's um, a chance to um, take questions at this point, but I'm very, very happy to to speak to anyone. And um, yeah, thank you for your attention. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Kevin. Very good introduction. I think we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. So, um, second speaker, uh, Jack. We'll just need a hand technical to get the slides up. Um, Chris Johnson. Chris is responsible for AFBI, which is the Agri-Food Bioscience Institute um, Agri-Environmental Technology Unit at AFBI Hillsborough, Northern Ireland. Uh, the facility was open in 2009, coordinates the research being conducted uh, across AFBI sites uh, in areas relevant to bioenergy and biomass. So um, 16 years experience in this field, uh, without further ado, over to you, Chris. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Much. Thank you very much. Um, not the same amount of experience as, as Kevin, to be fair, but uh, hopefully hopefully, some to get me through. A um, little bit about ourselves. We, as John said there, the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute, essentially we're an arm's length body of the Department of Agriculture and Environment. So we carry out some research I'll, I'll cover shortly for the Department of Agriculture, but, but elsewhere as well. We're based around lots of different sites, so we manage... Um, we, we sort of manage a lot of different agricultural research, you know, and also crop herd, all that kind of stuff, crops and herds. Um, we have a ship as well that we, ma we, we monitor sea stocks and things with. So we're responsible for a lot of the agri-food aspects that continue in Northern Ireland. Um, our research, you're not going to be able to read that on the screen, I don't think, but our research covers things like kind of animal health, plant health, the health of the national herd, animal diseases, um, also kind of, you know, surveillance. But the bit that I'm involved with really is about environment and environmental protection. And that is the direction that I've been bringing biomass crops in because it's difficult, it's a difficult sell to move biomass crops in a part of the country which is absolutely focused on the production of food production of dairy products largely then um, you know dairy dairy herds beef sheep yes poultry but but biomass is a real difficult sell so what i'm going to sort of cover here and hopefully it'll it'll come across is ways in which we can integrate biomass crops 
for a number of different uses within our agricultural environment, within our livestock, our intensive livestock sector. Um, we've been operating a number of different activities in AFP over, I'm going to say since probably about the mid-70s when I apparently we had an oil crisis. can't quite remember it, but I, I should. Um, so since then we were looking at biomass crops for, for displacement of fossil fuels to try to bring some kind of energy security, indigenous energy, energy security to a part of the UK. Um, no, so we're investigating SRC willow, you know, for 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 yields, for for different types of genotypes, for resistance to disease. What sort of uh, mixing should we do? And we would have worked with guys like Kevin in those stages, because as a willow, willow breeder, it would have been very important in order to kind of develop this sector. So when farmers do come about planting a load of willow, they're not going to lose it with a big attack of rust, or they're not going to, you know, lose it just because the crops tend to sort of die off through old age or something. Um, but what interests me is the environmental aspects here. So we've been looking at willows for, you know, for, for, for managing diffuse pollution from livestock, which is what I'm going to talk about more. Um, I've been looking at it for wastewater management. Kevin mentioned there the nutrient neutrality that we hear a lot about in England at the minute in building new houses. Well, we've been doing this for quite a long time. We've been implementing willow plantations to take the discharges from wastewater treatment works, from industries, from dairy processors, food processors of other types, and irrigating those leachates, if you like, and those wastewaters into willows. So there is no discharge. There is nutrient neutrality. So we've been doing it for, for, for quite a long time. So we might see these nature-based solutions coming back a little bit more um, if, those, if those kind of things sort of propagate. Um, the picture on the right, if you can see it to a degree, this is what we've been doing at our research farm in Hillsborough since, since the Energy Centre was built in about 2009, I think it was. Um, so we, we do have uh, an energy centre with about three different biomass boilers in there, all Austrian made for some reason, but all, all uh, and also a CHP, a CHP from the AD plant as well. So we're digesting, making biogas, bio, biogas comes down to the energy centre, we're burning our own willow chip on site, we're burning the biogas on site, we're creating heat and power from that, we're using all our own willow. Like, we're also using that willow plantation for the management of our farm wastewaters. So we fertilize the willow crops on the wastewater from the farm, zero discharge, uh, you know, applied to nutrient requirements. We've got a lovely kind of circle, if you like, circularity within that whole system. I reckon last year when our oil prices shot away through the roof, where oil was, I'm trying to guess here, what, 12 pence a kilowatt hour? 10, 10, 12 pence, it was up and around that. We were burning our own biomass on the site, which was costing about a penny and a half. You know, it took, it took things like that to kind of say, all right, Chris, maybe there is something in this whole biomass. So now I've got this whole field, this five-hectare field, which is dedicated to the Biomass Connect project, which Kevin mentioned there, and the tent is way the other side, where we're demonstrating a load of different crops. Um, you know, there's, there's, as he said, there's miscanthus, there's willow, there's willow variety trials, there's... there's, there's um, there's different types of tree, which I don't know very much about, even though I'm an agroforestry event. Um, the hemp as well, which is a crop that is that interesting and a lot of excitement. But the point is, it's things like that which start to get people's ears up. Um, but I'm going to talk about it, something else here as well. But just, just because we are at an agroforestry show, I did steal a few slides from a colleague of mine who's been working in agroforestry for a long time. And AFPI is involved. Um, I've got a colleague, an ex-colleague, he's retired now, called Professor McAdam. And he's been working on agroforestry for a long, long time. As I say, he's retired now. And there's just a few pictures here. This, this, this was set up in Loch Gaul, if you've ever heard of our site in Northern Ireland called Loch Gaul. But it's kind of a centre of agroforestry excellence and connected with a number of identical sites across Europe. And I just thought it'd be useful just to put a few slides of this up because they're, they're, they're lovely pictures with everything else. Um, it was ash of all the trees. Yeah, there was ash that we'd used. But the ash has been a valuable crop. It's been a valuable biomass crop. It's actually used for um, hurley sticks. So it actually has a high value. It's not going for biomass, not burned. It's actually high value products. The, um, sports equipment is made, made from it. And that's just some of the pictures there. And I kind of quite like that one. That was when it was just planted three years old and the lambs and the sheep wandering through it. And even more so there, there it is, eight years old, 16 year old, 16 years old. These are the pictures. I hope you can see them at the back okay. But I, I, I kind of do quite like this. But I think what's important is the science that comes out of that. And I've, I've kind of um, distilled this down to a few, a few sort of points. And the, 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 the graphs on the right just show you, you know, spiders, <laughs> like them and loathe them, but I know they're really important to our ecosystem. So spiders, birds, beetles. Without a doubt, it is conclusive that this kind of system does bring about an increase in biodiversity. There's, there's no argument to it. And even, I think, a lot more interesting, especially in a part of the UK where we are having more and more difficulty with things like um, you know, slurry, 
runoff, nutrient runoff, um, ammonia emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. You know, the enteric, the enteric livestock sector is qu under quite a lot of pressure here. So when we see things like that graph on the right, the agroforestry reducing the moisture content of the land, allowing the longer grazing seasons, makes a big difference when it comes to the, the problems of certainly of ammonia and of runoff, because of course there's the, the house less, there's less slurry, all that kind of stuff, um, they're out and about. Um, and I think that's sort of quite interesting. The long-term and short-term carbon, which of course is more and more of a discussion these days as well, and how that gets quantified and even monetized, I'm, I'm not the expert on that at all, but you know we, we can show indeed that we are improving the carbon stocks by by integrating biomass onto into a, an agricultural system. Um, but th those are a few few agroforestry slides, which are still from a, from a colleague. I I'm, I wouldn't be the, the the best expert in that, um, but there's probably about 500 people here who who are. Um, but what I want to talk a little bit more is just about biomass crops. So how we have integrated willow crops within our agricultural system. I've, I've mentioned that, you know, it's, it's not a popular land use. You know, it, you, you can't, the cows can't eat it. You know, you, you can't, where's the market for it? There is no real supply chain. We've had one for a bit, and, but, but we don't really have anything. So there's no reason to plant, especially then when dairy prices go through the roof and there's a big demand. And as Northern Ireland, we, we, we are a population of about 1.9 million but we produce the protein for about 10 million people. So, you know, there is, a, there is a, an onus and responsibility within our farmers that, that we have to produce as much, as much protein as we possibly can do. But that adds pressure to the environment, and that's kind of where I want to, where I want to focus on. That picture in the top left, just by the way, is a, a phosphorus map, where you see the, the red and the, and the purple colors. Those are areas of the country which actually have nutrient which is too high in the soil way and above the optimum that the crop requires. So if you are way and above the optimum of what the crop requires, I'm talking grass here, then absolutely some of it's going to find its way into the rivers and the lakes and ultimately the coasts. And we've had blue-green algae scares this year in Loch Ney, you know, our biggest lake. We, we have increasing soil, soil reactive phosphorus in our rivers and our waterways. It's increasing year and year and year. So it's unsustainable. So we need to try to find ways to sustainabilize that. So what really I'm talking about here now is, is how we've been doing a little bit of work in AFB in, in using these willows within sites, so diffuse pollution. You may or may not know, but we've had, I think it's the world's first soil nutrient health scheme, so a countrywide soil nutrient health scheme, whereby we will, in, over a period of about four years, be sampling 700,000 fields. And the farmers will get data from all those 700,000 fields, and over 90% of farmers have signed up to it, they'll get the data on their soil health, they'll get data on their, on their, their nitrogen, their phosphorus, potassium, their pH, their carbon. There's quite a lot of information will come through, but also what they'll get is this kind of, this kind of picture here, which if you like is a, if you've seen it before, great, but if you haven't, it's a sort of a, um, again, it's one of my colleagues who's the expert in this, but it's LIDAR, and it's, it's with digital, tra digital terrain mapping, looking at the soil texture and the soil type of soil it is, we can predict where the likely runoff is going to be within any particular area. So a farmer can get his maps, he can look, and he can see, all oh, right, there's a couple of points where if I apply too much slurry to, the likelihood is that that's going to find its way out into the environment. Okay, so that's quite a useful tool to have. So back in about 2016, I persuaded them to give me, give me one of a, of a subcatchment on the research farm, which it shows you here. And I think you can see that it's, it's quite self-explanatory, I think. But, you know, where, where you see the blue lines coming down, it's towards that central point, which is a sort of a red river up the middle. Well, it's a red line. It's not a red, red river. It's a, r a red, red line up the middle. So you can see these breakout points where if we have cattle grazing or slurry is spread or dirty water is spread, there's a good chance... At, a, at an extreme rain event, we're going to get some of that into the waterway. So what can we do about that? Well, I thought, well, what if we kind of demonstrated that we could plant this area up? Kevin mentioned using uh, you know, forestry for, for flood mitigation. So it's kind of a similar thing, but except I'm planting it here at about 15,000 trees per hectare density because it's willow. And I want to plant this so it will intercept the runoff that's coming down the hill. So I'm thinking that would be quite a nice area to plant there because I'm going to intercept quite a lot. It would be a good, good site to do some research on as well. And interestingly, I've just drawn a square there in red. We have, an, we have a, a replicated site to give us some, some sort of credible science out of as well. So we can actually say, well, let's, let's do that. Now, what, what we did here, there's the site. I got learning how to use a drone, drone up. This is a few years ago. We got a nice summer's day. Um, and we can see there, hopefully you can, you can transfer the picture I showed before into that particular picture. You, you can see the, the sort of the triangle there. So I'm looking at it from the left end down to the right, and that's it. That's it looking down. 
The square there that I've just outlined as well, that is a replicated site. And you can see I've planted three blocks of willow at the end of that as well. In a little bit more detail, that's what I have. So I've got, I've got six hydrologically separated zones that run down. Any runoff that runs, falls on that or any rain that falls on that zone will run off down through either the grass or through the willow. And I've been running this now since about 2016 to try to give some evidence that actually willow is a good crop for biofiltration block. It's a good crop for riparian protection. It's a good crop to kind of live alongside our high intensive agricultural systems because it can provide all of this. And not forgetting, of course, we're harvesting all this and we are now two out of three years self-sufficient in biomass purely from the willow. And the farmers makes the other year up with um, you know, cuttings and trimmings from hedges. So we can basically cut off the oil altogether from that particular farm area. So this is really what we're trying to get to. Those of you who love a graph, all this is really showing is it's a cumulative phosphorus export from average cumulative phosphorus export from the different zones. The top one is the cumulative export from the grass, and the blue one is a cumulative export from the from the uh, from the willows. Now, it's kind of it's had hicks and starts. The the, the platform has had a few problems. We've had COVID in the middle. We couldn't send people out to take samples. But we we've been monitoring this all the way through. And in fact, to bring it into a little bit more detail, the, the same picture top left is one I've just shown you. But the one on the right is me compiling all the recent years together. And we're getting on average about sort of you know 30, 35 percent of a reduction in mass of total phosphorus discharge, this particular total phosphorus discharge from, from the willow. So the willow is reducing the export, if you like, by 30 35%, which I think is quite a big, quite a big uh, saving, quite a big protection, 35%. Um, how is it doing this? Well, we know, we know kind of how it's doing this, and the, the bottom two graphs kind of show really what's going on. It's, it's reducing the moisture content of the soil. The willow is a good, thirsty crop, big, big evapotranspirator, um, sucking water up, also by the kind of the turnover of its sort of roots and you know, the, the death and new ones going down. We're getting a good permeability, and that's indicated by the graph in the bottom right. You know, we can see we've got much more hydrological connectivity. That's basically done by timing how quickly water runs into the soil using a sort of a, a robotic pod with a laser that fires down and keeps filling up and keeping the pressure the same. But we've got far higher far higher water running down through the willow plot. So as that water is running down your farm field with all the slurry and the nutrient in it, it hits the willow plantation and it just, it just sort of goes down into the soil water system where it starts to fertilize the crop, feed the crop, um, and of course it doesn't then, then um, uh, hit the riverway. And of course the, slow, the slowing down by the surface roughness will of course let a lot of sort of solids drop out of it. So that's kind of what we're doing. Now we, we know that the crop's getting good, it's getting a good nutrients so far because we're getting good yields off it. Every couple of years we harvest it and we're getting good yields, consistently good yields. So we're not, we're not starving it. Um, likewise, let's go back to this this original um, plan that I wanted to do. It was an EU, EU funded project. Um, you can see it there, catchment care. Um, it was to kind of demonstrate and show that we can actually do this on a, on a sort of a micro catchment basis as well. It's about a 22 hectare catchment. Um, so quite important to monitor the data there as well. And we are monitoring the data upstream and downstream. But what, what we don't have is we don't have an awful lot of data on the actual flows. So I again um, uh, invaded another, another colleague's office and said, you're a good modeler. You can model on all the, the hydrological flows that come down. And he, does, he, he uses something called a, uh, a source load proportionment model. Um, Anyway, it's a little bit above my, little bit above my pay grade. But what he said is that look, looking at the soil, the soil types, the different crops, the hydrological loading, the rainfall, everything else, I can feed it all into my model, Chris, and I can I can see that you do have a reduction over those years as a result of that plantation. Now that's from modelling, and that's really what those graphs show. So what I'm showing with the replication. Uh, which is which is absolute. He's actually modelling it right now. I'd love to carry this on further, of course, but I think that's all quite quite conclusive. Why we're not planting more willows in biofiltration blocks or riparian, I don't know, um, but it's where we are. Those of you who are interested in any in any kind of reading around the science of it, there's a load of different publications now. But we've we've gone a lot further and we've actually shown how converting three percent of your farm land area into a crop like biomass, where you're using it for energy supplies. We've, we've, we've kind of revealed how it can aid you in your greenhouse gas reduction, your global warming potential. There's quite a lot now of published literature saying we should be doing this, you know.
Um, but it's all about value added. You know, it, it's okay for us. We're planting that crop. We have a use for it. We can harvest it. We can process it. Um, and we are offsetting oil with it. And that's a, that's, a big, that's a big financial... Okay, we're doing it from an academic point of view, but, you know, we, we are making that financially worthwhile. But for farmers, there's always the view is, how can we make it... How can we make the crop kind of valuable other than just selling it to, to biomass? And I just wanted, in my last two minutes, actually, I just wanted to really touch on, a, um, on, a, on another project which, which I've worked with Kevin on, which was exactly about this. We all, know, we all know aspirin. We all know it came originally from willows. We all know it's salicylic acid. But there's a whole range of chemicals in these materials. So we enlisted the, the help of, of Kevin, and we chose... Uh, about 30 or so genotypes which are really prolific in producing these compounds. And we've grown them. We've worked with the University of Limerick in analysing these different compounds. We've asked with, with Trilli IT to look at the effectiveness of these particular compounds in terms of uh, you know, tissue, tissue effect. And we are now, uh, although the project is on the, on the verge of actually producing you know, salicylic, or for, for, I suppose we call it salix bioactive compounds for creams and shampoos and ointments, and but also as well as that, it's being used in uh, in uh, replacement cups. Sorry, uh, what do we call it? Sort of paper replacement product, plastic replacement products, cups, um, bowls, vomit bowls is one one area where they're going into in hospitals. I know, <laughs> lovely. Um, but but there's some other other uses for it as well. So so no, that's that was really that's really what it is. And I'll come to another picture. I thought I had it up there. But that that's one of the one of the sites we we did it here. This is our research site in Loch Gore, where the agroforestry that I mentioned earlier was going on. We also have done it in uh, University of Limerick site, which happens to be in in Mayo, not Limerick. And we've done it in a couple of French sites as well. And that's that's really what 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 it looks like now. Again, I, I told you I love a drone, so I couldn't resist getting out there and, and do, doing the particular sort of drone photos. Um, but, um, yeah, that's just to show you that we, we did actually have some quite significant work to do. And, yeah, and, and here we are. And the picture in the top right is the one I was looking for earlier. That's the kind of products that we, we have been making and intend to be making, and that's with the University of Bangor. Um, and the, the, the bottom left are the prototype creams. So this we see as a real way to try to, try to raise a value and create a value to make the crop, the willow crop, potentially more financially feasible. So in an ideal world, you could plant the willow, protect the environment, run your farm, and you could actually sell some of it off for a high-value financial return, which, which I think would be, would be nice. How does me, John? Thank you very much, Chris. That was excellent. Thank you. Um, we'll just switch the uh, presentation over, and I'll introduce the last speaker. Lots of questions in my head already, so hopefully you have as well. Um, our last speaker is David Wolf. Yeah. You can tell how really well organized I am. I haven't read David's biography. That's my failing. Um, David is from Wakelands Farm in Suffolk, probably one of the most long established agroforestry systems in the UK. Um, I've been there a couple of times. I was privileged to meet his father, Martin Wolf, who many of you will probably know of if you haven't met him. So fantastic that uh, David's going to have a look at a a, a, a view of agroforestry and biomass from a more practitioner's point of view. So, David, great to have you here. So, uh, I want you to look at the pictures because this is very much about pictures. So, this is um, a farm scale biomass project. I think picking up actually a lot of what Chris was saying in his closing words about how to make um, growing biomass short rotation coppice pay um, and heat your house at the same time. So, um, just a bit about Wakelin. So, we are in East Anglia between Norwich and Ipswich. Um, we are uh, 56 acres, 23 hectares, uh, like that. Um, Wakelands was bought by my parents in 1992. That's a picture of a wheat field. Um, that wheat field is now 30-year-old, uh, 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 semi-mature, I keep being told off of calling them mature, maturing uh, oak and uh, other trees. Um, and that's an example of when our first agroforestry was being planted back in 1992. So literally putting uh, 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 whips into a wheat field in 1994. So that's what gives us that long-term perspective. Um, by 2005, the agroforestry looked like that, um, and now it looks like that. So those are different areas of our alleys. I'll show you an aerial photograph in a moment, um, but each of these are different types of alleys. Um, the ones that are less interesting for the purposes of this presentation are these three, because these are um, some of the more mature uh, fruit trees and timber trees and so on. The one at the top right, if you can see that, um, that is one of the short rotation coppice areas, and so that's our biomass crop. 
Um, that's an aerial photograph of Wakelands, which shows how we are an agroforestry oasis within the Suffolk agribusiness desert. Um, that's a bit closer. I'm going to blow these up and show them more information in a moment. So each area has a different area of activity in it. And the one that's interesting for today's purpose is, is area C, and then I'm going to show you area F in a moment. So area C is about five acres, and each of those lines there is a double line of hazels. So those, those are common hazels. They were planted in the late 1990s. A double line, because that means that on our short rotation coppicing cycle, we coppice every seven years, so we take out a seventh of the lines every year, but we don't take out both in the pair, so it's going up and down like a, 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 a sort of comb or whatever, and so you never get a view through. And then in these alleys is our organic rotation. So that's short rotation hazels. I'll show you what happens to those in a moment. And then round the corner, other side of the aerial photograph, these are short rotation willows. So again, an area of about um, four and a half acres. Um, I think we have two kilometres of willow and about a kilometre and a half of hazel in terms of t actual hedge length. But you see they're very much in the agroforestry tree lines. In between them, this is a couple of years ago, so in between them, um, at that point, this was wheat. The um, uh, following year, it would have been lentils. The willows are single lines rather than double lines. Um, and here we take out on a two-year cycle, so we take out half each year. It used to be done every other one, but that didn't work with the organic rotation. So we now do half the field and then the other half of the field with the willow. Um, we uh, coppice them, in each case, the willow and the hazel in about February, uh, and that's our annual cycle. Um, that's what it now looks like. There's a slightly nicer photograph, so you can now see the hazels very clearly. These are the double lines of hazels um, in our overall agroforestry system. So they are part of the agroforestry system alongside with areas of agroforestry which are fruit trees and areas of agroforestry which are timber trees. But they have a very specific purpose, these biomass crops within our overall system. Um, so that's looking down one of the alleys of, um, these are the hazels, uh, that's looking down one of the hazel alleys, so you can see it's a roughly a 10 metre wide agroforestry alley. Um, this is a few years old now, this hazel picture, but um, uh, they are, um, the, the alleys, are, the, sorry, the tree lines are going up and down all the time, um, coppiced in February down to the ground and then coming back over seven years. Uh, that's a rather nice winter shot, so you can see there fairly mature uh, coppicing. Each one's probably now being coppiced about three or four times in its lifetime. And so we get fantastic growth from the very mature uh, uh, root systems every year. Um, here, this photograph, I tried to take a photograph to show you how the double hedges work. There's a double hazel hedge. Um, if you can sort of see the right-hand side, it's a little bit lower. So this particular half a line, as it happens, that's the coppicing in February of this year. So I took this photograph last week. Um, and so even within, uh, what is it, February to September, they are now, it's now four foot tall um, in that new growth from in that one season. So hazels in one area, willows in the other. Um, this is our lentil crop. They're about to be harvested. So lentils, high value crop alongside hazels, high value crop. Um, this is um, uh, how we process it. So we effectively have two activities going on. One is a very specific harvesting of what for us is a very high value crop. So we literally have a guy with a chainsaw going along, this is the willows, but he does the same thing for the hazels, and takes out the best ones one by one by hand. And I'll show you in a minute the numbers, that is very lucrative. Okay? So the best ones are taken out in January into early February, one by one, to give us fantastic sticks. Um, and so there he is with his chainsaw. Uh, going along doing it by hand and that is very lucrative may not look like a lucrative activity but it is I'll come back to that in a second and what that produces is a tractor full of fantastic in this case willow staves but we do the same thing with the hazels with the willow as you can see they're a couple of meters long with the hazels they end up being about three three and a half meters tall um, thick as a broom handle and they are sold for fencing hedge laying and gardening and everybody likes an invoice that's an invoice, March 2022. We sold, this is just to one customer, thousands of hazel sticks at £1.40 each. So our, uh, those sticks are £1.40 each, um, not retail because we're selling thousands of them here, to a guy who was doing hedge laying, and about £1 of that is profit. So our most profitable agricultural activity is growing sticks in a short rotation hazel cycle coppicing. That's what Chris was talking about, okay? So that's 5,000 pounds of income just from one customer, okay? And that's coming off the guy who's literally chainsawing. So our costs are quite high because it's paying somebody who is a skilled person to do chainsawing. But that's not what this is about. This is about biomass, okay? This is 
one of the different techniques we have used for um, the remainder. So the stuff that hasn't been taken out by Paul with his chainsaw is then, uh, can I make, oh, the video works, is then processed. And I'm going to show you different videos of different techniques. Um, this is a sort of conservation tool, and the advantage of this tool um, is quite intensive, as you can see. But you can see from the video, he's taking out the bunches and then laying them down. Now, that laying down is quite important for us in terms of how we can then process them with a tractor in order to pile them up. And that's also, it's also quite important for us because they have to be laid down in February at a point where only his tracked vehicle can get onto that land. We couldn't get an ordinary tractor onto it. So they have to sit there until about April when the land is dry enough for us to get on with an ordinary tractor. And if they're not laid out neatly, neatly by then, we have no chance at all of getting them up through the grass clover lay or whatever it is that's in that location. So that may look like a fairly intensive activity, but it's necessary in terms of our seasonal management. So that was one technique. Um, the slightly more crude technique, um, which we also use, uh, uh, is literally a one meter wide circular saw on the end of a tractor arm. I have no idea what the health and safety of that is, but um, fortunately the guy is in his tractor. Um, I wasn't the photographer here. I wouldn't want to be too close to this thing. Um, uh, it is a metre wide and it's spinning at ankle height. Unfortunately, as you'll see in a second, uh, can you see, yes, the guy is in the tractor. Um, but the problem with that is that they come down very quickly and efficiently. It's like a massive um, brush cutter, um, but they come down laying in every direction. So that's harder to process. So we haven't yet cracked that we've got these two different techniques, each of them has advantages, we haven't yet cracked it as to how to do um, that different activity. What that then results in is an enormous pile, and this is not the, the whole pile, an enormous pile of either hazels or willows, as the case may be, and they are piled up in February when they're cut like that and left to dry. And in a dry year like last year, they are more than dry enough by the autumn of that year. Some years we've had to leave them for two years, but in a dry year they're more than dry enough by the autumn of that year. And then we get in, so we've then had three different iterations, at least three different iterations, of chipping. So this is um, the smallest version of chipping, um, using a timber wolf, uh, as you can see, hand-fed, um, I mean, it's still a farm-scale thing rather than a domestic thing, um, but that is very labour-intensive, um, but it works. We then had two different guys with big machines. Um, this guy's big machine, uh, I love these videos, this guy's big machine, um, uh, was a bit like one of those food processors where you have a circular drum going around and you feed carrots in and things like that. Um, and uh, he wasn't very happy because his machine likes whole trees. He wants to feed whole trees in like you're putting carrots into your food processor. And our stuff here um, kept jamming his machine. He said it's a bit like putting green beans in your food processor. It's never going to work. So his machine was um, very fast and effective and produced lovely chips, but it was his machine kept breaking down. So we only got about half a day out of him because he kept having to de-jam the machine. But that is, out the other end comes this fantastic, lovely biomass. Um, this is a different machine, um, which feeds the, there's the thing on the side there, sort of feeds it in and it sort of chomps it up in a very satisfactory way. And um, it costs me about a thousand pounds to get one of these machines on site for the day. But in each case, this second guy, he had done it all in three hours. I could have done three times, it he, and he charged me for the day because he had to drive 250 pounds to get there, 750 pounds for him and the machine for the day, and I could have had done three times as much, but I haven't got more to do. So there's a sort of scale efficiency in that if I can make it work more. Um, this then is um, our pile. So we, um, our boiler is in not a very efficient place. Um, remember, this is what's left over after we've made thousands of pounds selling sticks. This is the, the waste product. So we then made a big pile. We made Harris fencing with, um, um, what's it called, Tyvek um, weed suppressant or whatever. And we made a big pile in the corner of our farmyard. Um, literally, uh, this is autumn time to make the pile. And the pile it basically fills that area um, to run our wood chip boiler for the winter. Uh, this is, so because its system's been laid out badly, what we've inherited in terms of the layout of the farmyard is not efficient. The boiler was put in the wrong place. So we do an unnecessarily large amount of moving wood chip around like this. But you can broadly see the size of the pile that was produced um, in that area. So that roughly was the amount of wood chip that was produced, mixture of hazels, willow, and hedge rubbish um, for each year uh, to go into our boiler. And our boiler is in the corner. So this is, I deliberately let the, the hopper run down so you could see the mechanism. So the hopper is normally, um, I mean, kind of an area about sort of this big here, uh, and we fill it up to the roof, and that's about two weeks' worth of chip. This is what it looks like when it's emptied. So here you can sort of see the blades going round, 
and um, they feed the wood chip into the boiler, which looks like that. So on the other side of there is a lovely Austrian, of course, Austrian, Gillies boiler, um, sadly installed before you got subsidies, um, but it's a 20 kilowatt boiler and occasionally it chomps on a big stick because it's not very well chipped, but that produces um, lots of lovely hot water to heat our house and our, uh, heat the house and the hot water in the house and the heating in the house. Um, and uh, that runs all the time. And um, uh, this is some work that was done by the Organic Research Center who are here. So they produced a pamphlet a couple of years back and this is taken from the pamphlet. And they did some measurements and some calculations on the Wakelands biomass system. Um, and they did the maths and uh, they worked out basically, uh, you can see this on our website if you want the more detail of it, but that this area of wood chip was big enough to heat a Wakelin sized farmhouse, so you get a sense of the scale of it. Just go back to the numbers. Um, it cost me about £1,000 to uh, get the guy in with the wood chip. It cost me about £1,000 for the guys who are moving it around, but for £2,000, that's enough to heat the house, a five bedroom house, and all the hot water for the winter, which is very comparable with other things. And then what's actually happened this year, this photograph is, it's hard to photograph this, but you saw this area being filled. Um, so this is the remaining pile photographed last week um, of our wood chip. Um, my, as I said, um, historically we produced uh, enough wood chip, you saw that, and the calculation was done that that was enough to heat a farmhouse for a year, whatever. This year we have half the pile left, half the pile left. Um, that's relevant because when me and my uh, kids were coming to Wakelands for many, many years, my parents would use the crop every year and Granny's house was always cold. And this year, um, we had the farmhouse lovely, toasty, warm, and we have half the pile left over. And the answer is insulation. So we insulated the farmhouse and now we have a massive surplus of wood chip, which we're now having to use for mulching and all the rest of it. Um, but it shows actually that the ORC calculations were pessimistic because you need even less land to produce as a waste product from your high production stick crop um, to heat a five bedroom farmhouse and so on. Uh, and so this is just a lovely aerial photograph of Wakelin. So that is our farm scale um, uh, uh, biomass come stick farming uh, operation. And you can see here, so there's the, there's the hazel alleys at the back there and there's other agroforestry things going on in the foreground. Thank you very much. That was really excellent, David. Thank you very much. Um, loads of time for questions. I'm just going to kick off with a quick one for David. Uh, are deer an issue for you in terms of browsing on regrowth? No, we have, we have, um, we have a healthy, uh, healthy population of muntjacks and Chinese water deer, so they're the little fellas, and we have a family of roe deer, a buck and three females, um, and I don't think there's any... They, they eat... If we plant fresh apple trees and things, they yeah. eat that, but the mature trees, I don't think there's any particular problem. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, questions then. We've got roving mics. Hi, um, thank you. Uh, do any of you use your biomass for biochar at all? And if so, why or why not? Yes, right, yes, so interesting. Um, we've just recently started doing a bit of work on biochar, but weirdly, I've been using it for a research, piece of research to try to find out what to do with biochar. Okay. So I've made biochar out of muscanthus and uh, pellets, wood pellets, and also digestate as well, coming out of the ADE plant. The reason being, everyone's talking about it. There's loads of research on it. There's a lot of UK government projects on, on biochar. But I, 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 purpose, I, I need to try to find out what to do with it. I can't get, get it around my head. You're just going to make biochar just to sequester carbon and then do what with it? Um, put it into soil. Absolutely. I know it goes into soil. but where the part of the country I come from and my soil colleague friends tell me that we have a lot of organic matter in our soils. You know, we're, 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 a, we're a livestock. There's slurry going on it every day of the year. Well, when it's allowed to go on every day of the year. Um, so, so, you know, that's not so much the issue. To, so to be paid for putting more carbon in the soil, I, I think we sort of struggle with that. So I've been looking at biochar for things like um, water filtration, uh, landfill leachate management, uh, taking out heavy metals, organics, um, ammonia, Absorption. We're really interested in using or using biochar as a potential addition into slurry tanks to reduce the ammonia emissions. That's a big problem for us at the minute. Um, looking at it as peat replacements, the guys who are doing the mushroom research quite interested in it potentially being a casing layer. It's low in nutrient. It's you know it could be could be useful for that. Um, 
and one or two uses. Are, oh yes, there's, there's also research that says you can add it into anaerobic digestion, you get a bit of interspecies electron transfer stuff that goes on, and it can improve your methane emissions and all that kind of stuff from an AD plant, you get better return. But I think these things are all need to, need to be worked on more. From my point of view, I'd love to just find a really good use for a circular use for it, because the carbon use I just can't fully, fully get. But it sounds like you might have uh, an answer to that. <laughs> I've got some ideas, but yeah, just interested by it more than anything. I've just thought of one really interesting one, actually. We've just started a piece of work, which is adding it with, with Queen's University in Belfast, where we are making the biochar out of, out of wooden materials now that I think the digestate could be a potential, could, could be an issue, but I don't know, and putting it into concrete. So the research shows that at a rate of maybe 2 2.5%, even up to 5%, it can go into the manufacture of concrete and actually it increases the strength of the concrete. I know this is all the rage at the minute talking about concrete, but um, but the, uh, the, the the research does seem to show that you could put a certain amount of biochar into that manufacture of cementitious materials, and that carbon is now locked away, and, uh, and that should have some kind of value, I think, for carbon sequestration or carbon lock away, greenhouse gas removal technology, I think. So that, that one's quite interesting. Yeah, um, so rather than using it on farms, I was thinking maybe more of domestic use selling it to uh, to customers, uh, but for soil enhancer. Yeah, well, that, that's it. Maybe maybe there's a horticultural use for that. I mean, I just have a feeling that my friends would put it on a barbecue. <laughs> yeah. Um, perhaps you'd like to go to uh, the Biomass Connect. Um, uh, yeah, the, the Biomass Connect um, uh, stall. Uh, there, there will probably be experts there from the Centre of Ecology and Hydrology. If, if not, then uh, they can give you details. But there, there is a project ongoing at the moment, a uh, government-funded project called uh, Reverse Coal. And that's uh, looking at uh, planting willow on um, areas of land that uh, should be peat areas, but uh, it's been where ex peat has been extracted and is uh, trying to uh, take it back and, uh, and put uh, carbon back into the soil by producing biochar, but uh, willow uh, as the, the, the crop on that land. More questions, please. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks for your talks. Um, so I've got a question about Loch Gore and a sort of general question. So specifically with Loch Gore, are we able to access the data on infiltration rates separately from what you published? Um, um, and then also, how is the actual grass itself managed, how is the grazing managed within this, this, um, the trial as a whole? And then for the maybe the whole panel, um, are you aware of or is there any plans to record information around um, dry matter yield um, for browse um, for things like willow, for example? Thank you. Uh, Chris, do you want to start off? Yes, yeah, so Lockall, have you, have, you been up to, have you been to the site in Lockall? Because it sounds as though you should, because it, yeah, I think it's, it'd be a good good site to see, because there's a load of other stuff down there. I did say that I'm, I'm not the expert by any means, I'm afraid, on that kind of work that goes on there. But the, the trials that run, I'm not so sure the grass is managed in any other way other than it's grazed. Simple, simple as that. Um, now, the, the project that originally that was set up under, of course, is long gone but we still maintain it from a sort of a demonstration point of view. And of course, we are trying to encourage through the Department of Agriculture an uptake of, of, bio, of, of, an uptake of agroforestry. You know, biomass isn't, isn't really on the radar, but agroforestry is, so it still uses a demo. But you know, it's not just, it's not just the ash, which is one I sort of mentioned there. There's, there's cherries and there's oaks, and there's, they've just started some work on pigs and oak, um, you know, grazing the pigs in the, in the oak trees, which is quite nice. But if you'd like, we could have a chat afterwards, and I could put you in touch with a proper, a, a proper intellect on it all. David, any thoughts on the interim, uh, the management in between? Kevin, I was going to uh, specifically look at fodder and browse. Uh, so this is something I, I didn't mention, and. Uh, uh, Chris, uh, strangely enough, said uh, cows don't like eating uh, willow. Well, they will. Yeah, they do. They do. Um, and uh, sheep love it. I mean, sheep will love it, and there will, is plenty of reasons to be feeding sheep willow because of all of the medicinal benefits, the tannins, the phenolics, all of these th these great things. Um, in terms of a, um, a sort of commercial project, um, the, the one thing that is out there and up and running and, uh, and happening all the time is uh, Chester Zoo. 
Chester Zoo feed all of their big livestock, um, giraffes and uh, uh, orangutans and rhinos, willow. And they have about uh, 20 hectares of the stuff. Um, uh, I've been helping them over the last five or so years, uh, maybe even 10 years, to produce that. Um, and the, it, it's, it's often a case of how they eat it and, um, and then disposing of it, which is the problem. And uh, looking at your fellow buncher, that's pretty much the way that they harvest it as well. Um, because as soon as you go in with a chainsaw, it all falls down and then someone's got to pick it up and it's a health and safety nightmare and everything. So even though it looks slow and uh, laborious, uh, picking it up and then putting it into a back of a wagon slowly is, uh, is good. Um, in terms of um, uh, dry matter and all of that sort of thing, it's, it's, it's something that is... Um, it's an open a door that's open that needs to be pushed and we need loads more information because uh, one of the things I wanted to say, and I forgot uh, in my notes, is that uh, most of the people that are in, still in the game uh, of the industry are looking beyond bioenergy. Bioenergy has been great in, in its way uh, as a sort of impetus, but it's never quite worked, especially on a large scale, things like Drax and everything. But there's plenty more money in it for growers, plenty more market opportunities for high value things like fodder, uh, like compost, like uh, biochar. Um, then things like the biocomposites, biopolymers, all of these wonderful things. Anything that you can produce with fossil fuels, you can produce with uh, biomass. And uh, this is the game that we need to be getting on. And the, of course, the thing that uh, Chris mentioned, that um, uh, biowheel refinery, that is the coup de grace, where a farmer can produce one crop and uh, get three things from it, maybe even more. But whilst the crop is growing, it's doing a job for you as well in terms of uh, pollination services and biodiversity benefits and all that. So um, there's, there's so much in this and uh, it's just, uh, uh, yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, question down at the front. Thank you very much. Um, you might have already answered this. Uh, I missed it at the beginning, but could you tell us about the requirements for EIA um, and... and whether there's a maximum area that you can plant before you need to get um, like an EIA, and also whether the land starts to become classified as, as forestry and has a restocking requirement after, you know, after you've stocked high density coppice in there. The rules around that. Good questions. Kevin, do you want to start? This is one of those uh, things that um, is problematic and no one really knows um, who wants to plant, but uh, if, at the moment, willow is classified as a forestation when you plant it. So anything that uh, is an EIA for woodland trees covers willow, uh, covers poplar, uh, eucalyptus, any, any of those. So you do need to be within the rules. The majority of people think, hold on a minute, why do I have to play by the rules if I'm not getting a grant, where every other person who's planting a tree is getting a grant. So uh, as a result, of course, most people think, stuff that and don't do it, but the rules are there. Now, in EnviroCrops, uh, one of our um, aspects of, of putting together this decision support system was to put that into place. We decided to um, hold fire just in case there was a, a, um, uh, a new scheme uh, coming out. So we, we, we'll put it on there so you can put in your date, your, your postcode, and it will tell you um, based on it being two hectares, five hectares, whatever, if, if you qualify. But uh, the other thing is it's a devolved issue, so um, it's quite complicated from that point of view, and uh, it was tying us in knots for a very small part of the budget, so uh, it's, it's going to be coming out um, at the back end of next year. But certainly, yes, you do have to. Thanks. Anybody else? Chris? David? Okay. Uh, more questions? Anybody? Yes, question down at the front. Thank you. Um, it was specifically to David. I wondered if you were doing anything with your hazels for cropping the nuts. Um, so, so um, because we coppice them, so the question was, are we doing anything with, with nuts? Because we coppice them at um, seven years, we don't really get any nuts. It's not, and my understanding is that the, the tree's not old enough or the um, branch's not old enough to produce nuts. So we get a very incidental crop. So if you went along a whole alley, you'd get a basket full of nuts, but it's very inefficient. So. On those, on the coppiced ones, no. We have other trees that have nuts, but not those ones. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 
Just a quick one to David as well. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you're the, when you've taken all the nice rods away of the willows and you've left all the small rods and then you've got those machines in, do you, do you, leave, you leave those on the ground to, to just dry, to sort of dewater to an extent? Or how do you manage the moisture content before you put it into your gillies? Um, so so the, the, the film you saw of uh, the machine laying them down... Yeah, so the reason we have to lay them down there is because, uh, I mean, basically they're, they're drying between February and September. Uh, so they do their first bit of their drying in the field, and that's literally to do with our fields being waterlogged. So they cut, they're cut in February, um, they have to lay down in situ until about April, because it's only about April we can get the ordinary machinery onto the field, and then they're piled up. But if we had different uh, soil and moisture effects, we would move them, we'd move them fewer times. Um, so they are, they are literally drying in piles. We don't do anything special or clever with them. Um, that's, it's as simple as that. Do you know how dry they get? No. You're lucky that they dry up the ground. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have that. OK, yes, yeah, question here, here, I think. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, um, yeah, just, just a quick uh, general question for you, for you all. Um, and, that, and that is, um, let me think about sort of uh, biomass for a little bit. And, um, I was just wondering, like, how much, you know, how much demand is there for for uh, biomass? Uh, um, in that, you know, and, and is there a need for for more biomass demand in a way to try and encourage it? Is it just domestic wood wood uh, you know wood chip boilers? And um, you know, often there's sort of a CHP plants and more community based ones. Um, does that need to be encouraged? Um, does do, do maybe power stations? Can we sort of try and sort of incentivize you know? The powers that be to try try and convert some of the existing, um, you know, gas burners and that sort of thing to more, you know, massive, you know, almost CHP type type events to create more of a demand so that there's more incentive for farmers to start producing willow more and there's a more you know uptake of the whole thing. Who wants to start? I've actually written a paper on um, energy crops policy since 1990. Um, and uh, I, I often describe it as my 30 years of her never stopped me dreaming paper. It's uh, that the, the, the sort of the big bioenergy sort of thing has been tried and tried and tried. Uh, give give the, the, the one person the big incentive and hopefully it sort of trickles down to the farmer. Unfortunately, that doesn't really uh, make it much fun for the farmer. Now, most farmers um, are. Uh, typically either livestock farmers or arable farmers and they love what they do that's why they do it um, in order to change it doesn't need to be something that makes them a loss it can be something that breaks even it can not even be something that's probably 10 percent more it needs to be a no-brainer because you're, you're replacing something that you love doing with say trees uh, but uh, or a perennial crop so this is the, the, the possibly the, the problem that, uh, that the, uh, the reason why those sort of things haven't worked in the past. Um, there is chances that um, uh, Drax will take some willow miscanthus going forward, but it's nowhere near the sort of numbers that uh, they were talking about in the past, which probably is um, gratifying to some people. But uh, of course, Drax is, uh, is sort of um, a swear word to, to, to many. It's it's one of the things, in a way, I suppose, that has uh, always queered our pitch because biomass covers them, it covers us small guys. Um, I've mentioned beyond bioenergy because I think there's many other better things to be doing in terms of uh, th than burning it. And uh, th th there's a huge big opportunity for wood chip in general because, of course, next year um, the UK goes on a domestic front anyway peat free and when you take peat out of compost you've got to replace it with something so from a uh, th from a perspective of replacing it with something you can either import coir or uh, use wood chips and uh, of course something that you can produce very very quickly is, is a, a great opportunity so I would like to think that um, there are many opportunities for people um, but uh, it, it is unfortunately a little bit of a leap of faith and also, with the, uh, the, the great thing with EnviroCrops is that we will give you that safety net, which isn't there at the moment. So anyone who plants and thinks a, a, a market will come along, they, they will be able to advertise 
500 tonnes of wood chip on the site and get the best price. Whereas at the moment, there's no facility to do that. So you take the bottom price or sell to the, the lowest bidder or the one that you know about, which is the power station. But, uh, you know, they, they, the difference between what a power station can offer and a, and a grower needs is vast. I'd, I'd just add a wee bit to that. Um, yeah, you, you do have a more of a supply chain. We, we have, as a microcosm in Northern Ireland, we did at one point have maybe, oh, I don't know, maybe about 2,000 hectares of willow growing, and that was being supplied to a number of different biomass boilers. Around about the scale, I'm going to say 300, 400, 500 kilowatt. So at that scale, it's actually quite, I think it's quite sustainable. Now, they, they, those biomass boilers would have been efficiently heating things like hotels, nursing homes, swimming pools, municipal buildings, government buildings. You know, those are, those are quite, quite nice kind of manageable, I think, scale, manageable size. And I think that kind of market is, it could, could work. But of course, even whenever we did have that, there was no... There was no RHI. There was just it was just a few guys who took a leap of faith because there was government incentives to plant the crop, so they got all those costs were negated, which meant their cash flows could look okay as long as they had a contract to, to sell their to sell the willow. And the interesting thing we were doing at the time to make ends meet, where we were using their willow crops as a biofiltration solution, as a waste a waste recipient. In other words, as a waste and treatment functionality. So we were able to actually fertilise those crops on organic materials that weren't actually that useful to anybody else. We could apply them into those crops, things like aerobic sludges from agri-food processing, sewage sludges, those kind of materials. And with those comes a gate fee. But that, some of the, we would pass some of that gate fee on, which made the whole financials of growing those crop worthwhile. Then along came the RHI, but in our case, the RHI didn't necessarily encourage that scale of boiler, which would have been nice, because that scale of boiler will use wood chip. A smaller scale of boiler will use pellet. Now you're into commodities, and that not, that not necessarily is going to come from a local farmer. It'll come on a massive ship across from Louisiana or somewhere. Slightly scathing, but there you go. Thanks, Chris. Any more questions? Yes. We'll have one last question down here. Um, question for Chris. You reminded me about the biofiltration of willow. Um, you mentioned effluent, but is there any um, benefit, let's say, with an organic farm next to a conventional farm and the huge amount of agrochemicals and the effect of that, if you're planting a willow buffer, for want of a better word? So, so pla um, planting willow buffers, on you mean on a farm, that the one I described here? Uh, no, sorry. So irrigating wastewaters? No, not... No. Uh, well, yes, but specifically conventional agrochemical use. So high agrochemical use from, say, a potato crop mm. next door to an organic farm. Okay. Would there be any effect from the willow biofiltration? Well, Cleaning it up, I'm saying, I guess. Yeah, well, I mean, the, 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 willow, the willow site itself, I mean, we're, we're not really using it for agrochemicals or anything like that. There was one example I gave. I do have some projects going with the Environments Agency to manage enclosed landfills, for example, which is where you might get sort of chemicals, heavy metals, organics, nasties, micropollutants, plastics, all that kind of stuff. But that's, that's separated. That's not on agricultural land. They're quite particular about that. Saying that in Northern Europe, there are projects like that that go on. They, they feel that there is enough um, containment. Um, so, so yeah, that would be separate. Now, that, that biomass will grow really well. I mean, I'm, I'm an unbelievable project I have, which is, which is comparing lysimitives, no irrigation to cons uh, irrigation of high levels, relatively high levels of leachate. And it's, it's more than doubled the yields, it's actually trebled the yields, but it's comparing it with nasty, horrible landfill site soil, which is you know, not particularly useful. But as soon as you start putting the leachate onto it, all that ammonia and all that water, just, just the crop just, just shoots. So when you have that, then you've of course got a much better media for applying the wastewater onto, so it's better at, at absorbing and preventing any other leakage. Um, just with the agrochemicals, I thought you might have been angling at maybe protecting organic farming sites from other sites that might be yeah I was, I was, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah so so i think i think those buffer strips yeah the, the the willow plants themselves have an affinity for taking up a whole range of different chemicals and the piece of work i'm doing with the with the swedes again slu is all about pfos and pfas and the forever chemicals you know the types of chemicals that we hear all about in movies like dark water and what have you um those kind of compounds are apparently from their research uptaken by the willow and depending on the molecule It'll, it'll go into different sides of the willow, to diff different sites. So the, the bigger molecules will get caught up in the whole root system. Um, smaller ones will get through into the roots, but they'll be preserved in the biomass. Others will get into the twigs. And some of them, apparently, can get all the way out and out through the leaf. 
Um, now I'm going beyond my, my capabilities and my skills here, but I think that's quite interesting. I've just sent them over a load of different materials so they can analyse what PFOS chemicals are in which constitu constituent, um, but it's held up in Swedish customs. <laughs> So um, if, if you are involved in any process that's producing an effluent, um, and in the UK, if you think of uh, farmers who are processing carrots, for instance, or something like that, you wash the carrots, the carrots go to Tesco or Sainsbury's, uh, there will be sort of very, pretty much benign wastewater, but it usually has to have a solution associated with it. And uh, often that can be a solution where you tanker it off and someone else deals with it, costing thousands and thousands of pounds. Putting a little bit of uh, your land to this and, uh, and putting that effluent onto the willow as a fertiliser is, is a really fantastic uh, way of going about things. It's the sort of things that uh, happen all the time in Sweden and uh, in Denmark and, uh, and in Northern Ireland and, and Southern Ireland to an extent, but uh, unfortunately in England it's uh, not happened as yet, but uh, I would like to say watch this space because I think it is something that uh, we will uh, catch up on. And interestingly, it's something that I would love to bring in to EnviroCrops as well, where if you've got um, something and you want to know how much willow to, it would require to get rid of um, from a phosphorus and nitrogen point of view, you can uh, calculate that as well. So it, it, this, this app, um, I hope you look at it. Uh, it will be something that is very, very helpful in many, many different ways, and it will be constantly revised, constantly updated, and, uh, and uh, improved. So I uh, hope to see you on it. Right. Thank you, everybody. Um, we must draw the session to a close now. Um, Lots to think about. Um, one of the messages for me today is think broader than just biomass as something for a boiler. There seem to be a lot more really interesting fields to use it in. Um, check out the information. On, you can get on websites, EnviroCrops, Biomass Connect. Really, there's some great stuff there. And if you get a chance, the, the Agroforestry Open Day weekend, if it happens again next year, around Easter, go to Wakelands. It's an absolute diamond of a place to go to. So thanks for your attention. Thank you very much to the three speakers. Thank you for listening. We'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Sainsbury's, and our other major sponsors, Farmers Weekly Transition, Forestry Commission, and Till Hill, and all the attendees for making this show such an overwhelming success. To get advice and support for your agroforestry project, Either visit woodlandtrust.org.uk forward slash plant or soilassociation.org forward slash agroforestry.